Hi everyone, my name is Tali Anasi. I'm a Senior Developer Advocate here at AWS Serverless. Today I'll be sharing what's new in the land of serverless and a brief summary of some of the things that we've launched this year. So my job is just to build serverless things and then teach the world about them. Before becoming a dev advocate, I was a test engineer and I did QA and automation, testing, all the fun stuff that you developers hate doing. <laughs> So over the past year, we announced a whole lot of new stuff at AWS, and it can be really hard to keep up with the pace and the volume of everything that's coming out. I know even myself as an AWS employee, I also spend a lot of time trying to keep up with all of our releases. And as with true AWS fashion, we're just releasing things left and right, up and down all the time. Um, so we're going to do this talk to talk about the key items of the last year that you might have missed due to the fire hose of information that comes out of AWS. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna be coming back to two themes. Serverless development is getting easier and faster. So as I'm going through these new features, look out for these icons. This icon on the left indicates the feature makes serverless development easier. The one on the right indicates the feature makes serverless development faster. And in the middle, it means the feature makes serverless development both easier and faster. So when we're talking about serverless, I want to focus very specifically on this concept of a serverless application that's centered around AWS Lambda. For those of you that are new to this space, Lambda is a compute service where you create your application code in what's called Lambda functions. We support six main managed runtimes. These are runtimes where we help with the patching, updating, feeding, watering of those languages, and we release new ones periodically. Those runtimes are Node, Python, Java, C Sharp, Go, and Ruby. We also have a concept that's called a runtime API, which allows you to bring any language that you want to Lambda. Now on either side of your Lambda function, there's two components. There's the event source that invokes your Lambda function and causes your code to execute. An event is something that happened that makes your Lambda function come to life. So maybe something was dropped into an S3 bucket, maybe an item was put into a DynamoDB table, maybe a payment was processed through a third party like Stripe, and then you have your destination, and this is what your function can talk to. That can be a ton of different services, both in and out of AWS. It can be databases and data stores, storage services, all sorts of things. So we'll be focusing on this concept of a serverless application, Lambda-centric event sources, and then other things that your Lambda code or your business logic might need to talk to. I'm going to be focusing primarily on what's new with just a couple of services, Lambda, API Gateway, Step Functions, Event Bridge, and the serverless application model. These are some of the most commonly used serverless services. So when people think about serverless, I think these are the services that you usually think about that usually come to mind. But don't forget, there are other services that we won't have time to touch on today. Amazon SNS is a serverless pub sub service that you can use to fan out messages to subscribers. SQS is a serverless queuing service that's useful for decoupling and scaling microservices. AppSync is a fully managed service that makes it easier to build GraphQL APIs. S3 is an object storage service that integrates really nicely with Lambda. And DynamoDB is a fully managed no SQL database that's great for massive scale. All right, so let's start with Lambda. Again, Lambda is our serverless compute service that lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers. There are trillions of Lambda invokes per month and hundreds of thousands of AWS customers use Lambda. It's a pretty large service that's used in a lot of different ways. So the first release I wanna talk about is Graviton2. Our friends at Annapurna Labs designed this new processor for the cloud called Graviton2. So now when you run your Lambda functions, you can either use the existing x86 chipset or the Graviton2 chipset. Let's talk about some of the use cases where that's beneficial. So there are certain types of Lambda functions, usually graphics processing or machine learning, that are very heavy computationally. In these computationally heavy cases, knowing what instruction set you're running is important because the library for those operations are designed for specific workloads. In most cases, running your Lambda functions with Graviton will make your workloads faster and more cost effective. But there are some workloads where that's not the case. Some workloads are optimized for the x86 chip. That's why using it is optional. We recommend testing it out before switching across. 
When you use Graviton, you can save money in two ways. First, your functions run more efficiently due to the Graviton 2 architecture. Second, you pay less for the time that they run. In fact, Lambda functions powered by Graviton 2 are designed to deliver up to 34% better price performance at 20% lower cost. And here's why. With Lambda, you're charged based on the number of requests for your functions and the duration, which is the time it takes for your code to execute. For functions using Graviton 2, your code executes faster, which results in 20% lower duration charges than the current pricing for x86. This is one way we're making serverless development faster. With the Graviton 2 release, you can target functions deployed with a container image or zip file to run on either x86 or ARM-based processors. If you're trying to decide whether or not to use Graviton, you can create two versions of a function, one using x86 and one using Graviton, and then you can distribute traffic to the two function versions. You can then measure performance metrics and look at key indicators with Amazon CloudWatch. The next feature we're going to talk about is cross-account ECR images. Lambda now allows you to create or update your functions with container images in a different account than that of your Lambda function. Previously, you couldn't access a container image stored in other accounts. You needed to replicate or copy your images into an ECR repository in the same account as your Lambda function. Customers often use different AWS accounts for different projects or for different teams across the company. So this allows them to pull images from other projects, other teams, or from other environments in those accounts. This feature is great for testing also because it lets you avoid the it works on my machine shenanigans. If you can pull the same container image and use the same data in more than one place, you're ensuring consistency between accounts and environments. And it also simplifies builds and deployment pipelines. Previously, you had to create an image in each account one by one. Now you create it in one account and you can access it from anywhere. It also simplifies CICD because you have one source of truth. Next, let's talk about event filtering. So with Lambda event filtering, you can filter messages prior to the invocation of your Lambda function. So previously, your Lambda function would get invoked based on events coming in from Kinesis, DynamoDB, or SQS, and then you would filter the events in your Lambda function. Event filtering lets you specify when you set up the event source mapping what type of event you're interested in. It could be an attribute of the event that you're interested in where you only trigger the Lambda function if this certain thing is true. So with event filtering, you have a dramatic reduction in the number of invocations in Lambda. You don't have to add filtering capabilities in your Lambda function. You just have to have your business logic. To set up event filtering from the console, first choose a trigger for your Lambda function. The Lambda service will then filter the messages that it receives from the event source before batching them and sending them as the payload for the function invocation. Let's look at an example with a Peloton race. So let's say you have a 10 minute race, which is 600 seconds. At the end of the race, you wanna know the final ranking of how you did. So you have a ton of users and at every second of the ride, each person has a ranking. But I don't care about the ranking during the ride, I only care about the final ranking. So during the ride, all of the events are being put onto a stream and being sent to Lambda. But Lambda is coming back and asking, is it final? Nope, okay, so I'm not gonna do anything. And then the next event comes in, is this final? Nope, so I'm not gonna do anything. And then it will get the final event with the final ranking, then Lambda will wake up and say, hey, that's the event I'm looking for, I'm gonna get invoked now and go do this thing. So event filtering makes serverless development easier because you can specify exactly what you want the Lambda function to respond to, and it makes serverless development faster because your Lambda function is only going to be invoked when you need it to be. Now let's talk about what's new with API Gateway. API Gateway is a serverless API service that makes it easy for developers to create, publish, maintain, monitor, and secure APIs at any scale. One of the big things we did this year was extend our mutual TLS support to third parties. Now you can import a third-party certificate such as VeriSign or DigiCert and then bind it to your custom domain name for a mutual TLS-enabled API. Previously, you could only have a domain name use a certificate generated from Amazon Certificate Manager without any third-party certificates. Right now, you can only use this for public regional API endpoints. It's not available for any edge-optimized or private APIs yet. But this is just one way that we're making serverless development easier because you have this integration with third parties. 
API Gateway also has a new integration for step functions. So step functions can now invoke an API Gateway endpoint. This integration provides an additional resource type shown here, and it can be used with both standard and express workflows. It allows customers to call API Gateway REST APIs and HTTP APIs directly from a step functions workflow. Developers can combine built-in error handling of AWS step functions with the authentication and throttling power of API Gateway. The next service we'll go through is Step Functions. Step Functions is a low-code workflow service used to orchestrate AWS services and build serverless applications. One of the most exciting things that Step Functions launched this year was the Step Functions Workflow Studio. Step Functions Workflow Studio is a low-code visual tool that helps you learn Step Functions through a guided interactive interface and allows you to prototype and build workflows faster. Let me show you what I mean. When you build a modern serverless application, you usually start with Lambda functions. And Lambda functions are stateless, event-driven functions that exist in the cloud. But there aren't many applications with just one function, one entry point, one module, one component, right? So there's going to be more than one function. And in fact, it'll be common to have lots of functions and lots of them talking to each other. And in fact, applications, serverless or not, tend to have databases. And in the cloud, a lot of them also have queues of one kind or another. Some of the Lambda functions even connect to servers. So this is more of what an actual modern serverless application might really look like. With the Visual Workflow Studio, this on the left becomes this on the right. All of the complexity is orchestrated simply and visually for you. The Workflow Studio is great for visualizing your workflows. So Step Functions is a tool that's used for workflow orchestration, right? So run this Lambda function here and this other Lambda function at the same time with parallel processing, and then over here, add a request from API Gateway. So this is a great place to visualize your entire workflow end to end. It empowers developers to focus on their business logic while reducing the time spent writing configuration code for workflow definitions and building data transformations. With the Workflow Studio, you drag and drop different actions from AWS services, configure them all from the UI, and then monitor your executions. With the Workflow Studio comes the AWS SDK integration. So Step Functions has added support for over 200 AWS services and 9,000 APIs with this integration. Until this launch, when developers were building workflows that integrate with AWS services, they had to choose from the 46 supported service integrations that Step Functions provided. If the integration was not available, they had to code it in a Lambda function. This is not ideal because it added more complexity and cost to the application. Now with this integration, developers can integrate their state machines directly to the AWS service, making it easier to orchestrate workflow development. Next up, we have this new update with AWS Batch. Batch is a cloud-native batch scheduler that you can use to efficiently run batch jobs on AWS. So we've added console support for visualizing step functions workflows. And this is really useful because batch jobs are usually not just a single step. They're a set of coordinated steps. So you can use step functions for managing this and orchestrating all of the steps. You can navigate more easily between your jobs, the workflows they're involved in, and add their workflow executions. So what we've done here is bring together two core AWS services to streamline management of your business critical workflows. Next up, let's talk about Amazon EventBridge. EventBridge is a serverless event bus that makes it easier to build event-driven applications at scale using events generated from your application. We touched on events a little earlier, but I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper. Let's start with a very successful event-driven application. The example is this, this website we run that's named after a river in Brazil. And I'm guessing a couple of you have visited this site before. The main objective of this site is to get you to click on the place order button. Once you press that button, a bunch of things happen. First, we check your credit card to make sure you can pay. Then we have to get the merchandise off the shelves and onto the trucks and so on. That all happens at an Amazon warehouse. There's no synchronous API call for the Amazon backend to package and ship products. What the front end does after your payment is confirmed is it puts together some information describing the event and puts your account number, credit card info, and what you bought in a packaged event and puts it into the cloud and onto a queue. 
Later, another piece of software will, will pull it off and start the packaging, shipping, and all of that. The key point about this process is that these things can all run at different rates. Normally, the rate at which people click place order and the rate at which the warehouses can get the boxes out of the doors are roughly equivalent. However, on days like Prime Day, Black Friday, etc., people hit that button immensely faster than the warehouses can operate. And that's okay. The back end will work itself through. This is clear event-driven architecture. Event-driven architecture is a relatively new concept in the cloud. Before, it was common for developers to use APIs to build their applications. APIs are used to talk to services, and it defines how the services should exchange information. Normally, when you first start building applications, you don't think to use events or event-driven architecture. API thinking is synchronous thinking. You can't move on until the API response comes back. With APIs, you send commands. Go do this thing. It has an intent, and it's directed to a target. Create this account. Add this product to the shopping cart. Go do this specific thing. An event, however, is something that happened. Maybe a new file has been created. Maybe an exception or error occurred. Maybe a new customer has been created. Maybe a new order has been inputted into the system. It tells you a fact. Events are also immutable, which means they can't be changed. Once it happens, it happens. In practice, it's just a JSON object that tells you something that happened. So again, with events, you're telling a fact, and others decide what to do with it. Request-driven applications that use APIs typically use directed commands to coordinate downstream functions to, to complete an activity and are often tightly coupled. On the other hand, event-driven applications create events that are observable by other services and systems, but the event producer is unaware of which consumers, if any, are listening. Typically, these are loosely coupled. In the simplest terms, an event is a signal that a system's state has changed. Events are represented as JSON. The attributes of an event are that they are facts. They are immutable. So once it's done, you can't unring the bell. For example, if a customer places an order and then cancels it, that's two events. Once the order happens, you can't undo it. If you want to cancel it, you create another event. Events are observable, so anybody who's authorized can watch an event. Think of an example of a coffee shop. You have a barista and you have a pastry chef. If I come in and I order an espresso, the barista responds, okay, I'm on it. The pastry chef doesn't care because it's not a pastry. However, if I come in and I order a chocolate croissant, then the pastry guy gets up and says, yep, I'm on it, I'm gonna make your chocolate croissant. And the barista doesn't care, he doesn't respond, it's not coffee. Events are temporal, so all events have a timestamp. If you imagine you're at a coffee shop and there's orders at 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., sometimes orders later that are later in the day don't get fulfilled because you run out of inventory. With events in AWS, there's a feature called Archive and Repeat, where you can simulate a day's worth of, of events. When your code falls over, how do you know what happened? So using this can take the day in question and feed it through your system in debug mode and figure out what went wrong. So a lot of people think events are scary, but they're just JSON. And if you can write JSON, you can write an event. Next is cross-region event routing with Amazon EventBridge. So using Amazon EventBridge, you can now route events from any AWS region to other supported region. The main benefits here are that you can centralize your AWS events into one region for auditing and monitoring purposes. You can invoke asynchronous workflows in a different region from a source event, and you can replicate events to different regions to help synchronize data in cross-region data stores. This makes it easier to develop multi-region workloads. EventBridge also just launched support for sharing events between event buses in the same account and region. So EventBridge offers a default bus and custom event buses in each region. So previously, you couldn't go from bus to bus in the same region or account, which tended to lead many developers using the default bus for all events. With this new feature, you can now route events to buses in the same account or the same region. This provides you with much more flexibility in routing events in your workloads. This can be useful for keeping events used in similar workloads on their own buses. For example, let's say you have an enterprise company where you have three buses, marketing, legal, and a developer bus. In this case, each event may arrive on the default bus. You could route events from the default bus 
to each of those departmental buses depending on what events they need access to. This makes serverless development easier because you can share events between event buses in the same account and region. Next, we'll talk about the Step Functions integration with EventBridge. So Step Functions now supports an integration with EventBridge that lets you send custom events from your Step Functions workflows to an EventBridge event bus without writing custom code. Publishing events inside workflows decouples orchestration logic. It also replaces the need for Lambda functions to call the EventBridge APIs. So now Step Functions doesn't have to call Lambda to put stuff on an event bus. Now you can just call EventBridge um, directly from Step Functions. This is another way we're making serverless development easier. Next, we're going to talk about the serverless application model. So many times when developers start building serverless applications, they start in the console. You choose the services you want and then connect them. You build your Lambda function here. You choose what you want as a trigger for your Lambda function. Here, you choose what you want as a destination. You create all the resources you need right there from the console. And this is a really great way to learn. The only problem comes when you want to move your resources to different accounts, or you want to move them from one environment to another, or just somehow replicate what you've done on the console. Chances are you're not going to know exactly how you set up the resources in the first place and exactly which configurations you set. To solve this problem, we're going to look outside of the console to templates. Templates are a way to store your infrastructure so that it can be reusable. With infrastructure as code, you're automating the provisioning process. That means you're not going to go to the console, click on the services you want, create the resources from the console, etc. You're going to use a tool called SAM, which we're going to talk about in a minute, to deploy all of your resources. We're going to instantiate infrastructure using configuration files. Basically, what this means is you have this template with all of the steps and configuration for your application that you can reuse whenever you need. This allows you to treat those configuration files as code. And what do you do with code? You version it, you put it in some kind of repo and GitHub or code commit or something like that. So you can deploy a version and then work on it and then merge a new version. You can roll back if you needed to. So when you move to infrastructure as code, you can do the same thing with your infrastructure. If something breaks and your infrastructure isn't working, well, let's roll it back or let's try a new version or let's move it over here to this other environment. And then finally, this allows you to eliminate configuration drift through automation. This is that classic, well, hey, it worked on my machine shenanigans. So let's say you get paged late one night because there's an incident for your mobile application. You look at the logs and you identify the problem. In order to fix it, you need to update a specific configuration in production. So you take the change and you make the change in production and you go back to sleep. Although you fixed the issue, you've just created an even bigger divide between your staging and production environments because you didn't make the same change in your staging environment. Many times, staging environments are not the same as production because of changes made during incident management, and this is called configuration drift. So with infrastructure as code, rather than having that shift in environments, you have one central authority that is this template, and then you push the infrastructure changes through. Now we have several infrastructure as code solutions here at AWS. The primary one is CloudFormation, and a lot of the other ones are built on top of that. The one we're going to talk about today is the AWS Serverless Application Model, or SAM. And then there's also the um, Cloud Development Kit, or CDK, which allows you to write a little bit more code. So you do have a few options here. So SAM is an open source framework for building serverless applications. So just how like React is a framework for building JavaScript applications, SAM is a framework for building serverless applications. It provides shorthand syntax to express functions, APIs, databases, and event source mappings. SAM comes in two parts. The first is the AWS SAM templates, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And this allows you to version your infrastructure as code. The second is the SAM CLI, or the command line interface. This is a utility that you install on your local machine that helps you with local development, debugging, builds, and deployment for your serverless application. Here's what an example template looks like. It's written in YAML. And you can see that there are a few resources being deployed here. You have a Lambda function, a DynamoDB table, an API. Um, so I created the Lambda function. I added the corresponding IAM role that lets the Lambda function talk to the DynamoDB table. 
there's a lot of options when it comes to policies to add to your services, and these SAM templates simplify them for you. You can change this to a write policy or whatever policy that you need. We're also creating an API from API Gateway. So your event source for your Lambda function here is this HTTP API, and you can configure these templates to add any AWS resources and create your application, and you have a lot of flexibility to build what you want in these templates. So with these 20 lines of code, this on the left becomes this on the right. So you have the Lambda function that's triggered by API Gateway. You have the DynamoDB table that stores the data. And what's already created for you is the permission for API Gateway to invoke the function. That happens automatically for you and Sam when you set API Gateway as the event source for your Lambda function. And then you added the policy saying you can only read from the table. Our newest launch for SAM is SAM Accelerate. The big idea with SAM Accelerate is that it makes testing your application much easier because you're testing in the cloud. With SAM Accelerate, you don't have to emulate your complete infrastructure. There's three new features of SAM Accelerate that we're going to talk about. Incremental builds, SAM sync, and aggregated feedback. To understand SAM Accelerate, we have to first talk about the difference between code and configuration. In this context, code is everything in your Lambda function, your Lambda layers code, your step functions Amazon states language file, and your API gateway open API file. Everything else is configuration. Incremental build is an update to SAM build. SAM build prepares the artifact that's going to be deployed. It makes sure all of your dependencies are in place and ensures you only have what you need. Before, when you ran SAM build, it used to be that it builds everything all the time, the code and the configuration, regardless of what you updated. It gets all the dependencies and all the code and packages it up and prepares the artifact for deployment. SAM builds doesn't push to the cloud, it just prepares um, local artifacts. Now, unless you add new dependencies, only the code itself is built out. And we did this because we, we realized that dependencies don't change that often. So there's no need to grab the dependencies every time you do a build. So think of this Lambda function, for example, if you have this Hello World Lambda function that's written in Python, it probably has BOTO3 in the request library as dependencies. So if you change something in your Lambda function code, when you run SAM build, it's, gonna, it's only going to update that code. It separates the cache and keeps dependencies separate from the code itself. We optimize this even further. Currently, when you wanted to test your code in the cloud, it would do a deploy and do a full stack update with CloudFormation, and it could take several minutes because it's deploying everything, not just what you updated. It would deploy both dependencies and code. Now, when you make a change and it's a code-only change, it doesn't deploy the full stack. It only updates what you changed. This makes serverless development much faster because the whole stack doesn't redeploy. SAMSync deploys that build for you that you just packaged up with SAM build and then pushes, pushes up what's changed up to the cloud for testing. You can also use SAMSync watch. That watches your code for changes and automatically decides if it should be a configuration update or a code update. If it's a configuration update, then you use CloudFormation for a full stack update. And then for code updates, it just updates the code. And it does this automatically for you. So as you make changes to your code, SAM is watching and sending those changes up for you. The last thing about SAM Accelerate I want to talk about is aggregated feedback. So before this launch, you only used to get Lambda function logs when you ran SAM logs. Now, in addition to CloudWatch logs for your Lambda functions, you get logs from API Gateway and traces from X-Ray. With SAM Accelerate, creating and testing an application is easier and faster. We created new functionality within SAM to get away from the idea of emulating the cloud locally. Instead, we're giving you the tools necessary to actually test your features in the cloud. Next up, we'll talk about SAM Pipelines. SAM Pipelines is a new capability of the SAM CLI that lets you automatically generate deployment pipelines for your serverless applications. A deployment pipeline is an automated sequence of steps that happen when you release a new version of an application. Now, what's great about SAM Pipelines is that with AWS, you generally have multi-account and multi-region deployments, and SAM Pipelines supports that. SAM Pipelines supports uh, AWS Code Pipeline, GitHub Actions, Jenkins, and GitLab, and we do have templates for all of these. 
SAM pipelines is composed of two commands. You have SAM pipeline bootstrap, which creates the AWS resources required to create a pipeline. And then you have SAM pipeline init, which is an initialization command that creates a pipeline file for your preferred CI CD system. You can also combine these two commands by running SAM pipeline init dash dash bootstrap, and it takes you through the entire guided bootstrap and initialization process. Next, we're going to talk about a, a feature called SAM delete. So this new command called SAM delete, what it does is it deletes your entire stack and all of its resources. It deletes all of the artifacts from the S3 bucket um, that's associated with the stack, and it deletes all of the container images and repos that are associated with the stack. Next up, I want to introduce you all to Serverlespresso. The serverless developer advocate team built a coffee bar that's built using serverless technology. We debuted it at reInvent, but, but since then we've been sharing it at other conferences and events. So let me show you how it works. There's multiple things going on here, and we used a few different serverless services to make this application work. Using your smartphone, you can scan a QR code that takes you to a menu. There you choose your drink, you customize it however you like, and then you receive confirmation once you place the order. Once a customer places an order from the ordering app, the order hits an API for an order manager service. The API invokes a Lambda function that writes the order to a local DynamoDB table, and then the service generates a new event that says a new order has been placed. That event triggers the step functions workflow. The step functions workflow goes through a series of validation steps. First, it checks to see if the shop is open. Then, is there capacity in the queue for the barista to make more drinks? Once the workflow completes, it creates an event saying, hello, the order is ready. That's picked up by the publisher microservice, which then tells the front end. And all of these microservices shown here are completely decoupled as events. So each cup of coffee follows its own journey of things that have to happen. At the end of the drink, you receive a report showing each service that your order used. There's three main apps on the front end that make this happen. First, the ordering app that customers use to place orders. Second, the display app that shows you the queue of drinks. And third, the barista app, which the baristas use when they're making drinks. Then you have the access layer, and this is how the front end talks to the back end. So when the front end makes a request, it uses the API. This is used to place new orders, get lists of open orders, cancel orders, and other functionality. The entire application is built with events. EventBridge choreographs the events through the workload, and each of the services either produce or consume events. Those that produce events send those to a custom event bus. Those that consume events use rules so that they only receive the events that they care about. Step functions orchestrates the entire order processing workflow. So this is where the validations are done. Is the store open? Is the queue full? It also does timeouts. The publisher service listens for a range of different events, new orders, canceled orders, completed orders, for example. It does this by defining rules on the EventBridge custom event bus. Another thing we launched this year is the serverless patterns collection. The serverless patterns collection is a repository of serverless examples that demonstrate integrating two or more AWS services. Each pattern either uses SAM or CDK. The patterns simplify the creation and configuration of your serverless application. You choose the services you want to work with, and then we give you the template that you deploy. We did all of the work for you. You're welcome. The serverless patterns collection is both an educational resource to help developers understand how to join different services, as well as an aid for developers that are getting started with building serverless applications. By using these patterns, you can experience firsthand what's possible in the realm of serverless, experiment with the many use cases of the code patterns um, that the patterns provide, and easily deploy your applications to the cloud. The entire collection is also available in GitHub so that you can clone it locally and build upon it in your organization. Every quarter, my team publishes an In Case You Missed It blog post on the AWS Compute blog. It includes launches from all of the serverless services, and you can use this QR code to access the last one that we published in Q3. All right, so we just covered so much information, so much new stuff happening in AWS and in serverless. 
And if you haven't been paying attention at all for the past 45 minutes, I want you to walk away from this talk with two things. Serverless development is getting easier and it's getting faster. And if you're like me and you can't get enough of serverless, head over to serverlessland.com where there's more resources, blogs, videos, workshops, and learning paths to help you learn more about developing serverless solutions on AWS. To build an application using the serverless patterns collection, go to serverlessland.com slash patterns, and then choose the services you want to work with in your application. You'll then see download instructions to be able to deploy your stack. Thank you so much, everybody. This was a brief summary of everything that we've produced in serverless in the past year. There's obviously not enough time to go through every single launch for every service, but our teams are constantly re releasing new features to make serverless development easier and faster. My name is Talia Nasi. I'm a senior developer advocate for AWS Serverless. Thank you so much for coming.